ಸ್ವಾಮೀಜಿ we are continuing this lovely series of uh, little questions and lucid answers and we have with us uh, two youngsters dr mukta and dr mukund uh, at least not yet but eventually so uh, mukta is already into her medical school and she is starting her graduate program she has already started it just now mukund is uh, undergoing graduation in uh, one of the prestigious institutes of america so he claims uh, williams <laughs> near boston and i checked up in the internet most of the world seems to believe so and uh, then we were actually discussing about all that they brought in a very interesting perspective of uh, some basic science behind habits and uh, they did some very interesting research on that they were privy to a lot of uh, latest research papers etc and i thought it would be great if they themselves uh, project it and uh, they themselves explain it and i asked them to take as much time as they want and if required we will cap it up with a summary and after they complete after they uh, finish their uh, you know presentation so it's about habits and there are some very interesting uh, researches happening and uh, the the thing which uh, excited us the most was uh, most of our day to day common practices seem to actually uh, augur well with such wonderful researches uh, done by, by one of the best minds uh, one, of one of the best, best minds in the east and the west so, so without, without much further ado uh, i have the stage and the mic to these two youngsters uh, mukka and mukta and mukund from hoste rather yeah, again to read right what ramu ji said uh, we both are students um and as children of the god satsang uh we just want to share some things that we thought were useful and helpful for us um and uh, we really hope that this is a uh, this is useful that you find this useful for you um that being said we'll go ahead and get started so our topic is uh, very specific um and we'll get into that a little bit uh but this is our purpose right here our overview of our presentation today is to understand how dopamine one single molecule is at the root of our habit formation uh and like we saw a few weeks ago ramuji said that habits constitute 40% of our lives and if we see the relationship between dopamine and habits we can realize that 40% of our lives is in a way determined by this uh one molecule and its uh significant effects uh on our brain and our habit formation process so with that being said we just want to reiterate right that there's so much available to us nowadays that we're just going to give you some preliminary ideas and some things that we've thought through yeah. and uh you know had some great discussions about so we we hope to inspire you to actually you know make use of all the sources that are out there and to be able to do some digging on your own and to find um how it relates we'll talk a little bit about how it applies to us uh in just a second yes so we we have a confession to make and that is that we binge um and uh, guilty yes <laughs> um whether it be youtube or netflix but today we're going to be focusing on how we are uh privy to binging youtube and to give you a little bit of context um you know being secondary or higher education students sometimes the stress can get to a level where you just want to escape right and over time uh this has become a habit and this is what we're going to delve into today we're going to see how dopamine has played a huge role in this in uh making this uh our our you know 
our uh, stress relieving stress relieving habit. Right. Um, so usually how this works is um, we will you know given uh, a certain period of time we become accustomed to binging YouTube videos whether it be I think personally for me it's in the afternoons I I've noticed that that's the time period. Um, and the issue though, we've come to realize that the binging does have downsides to it, when, uh, like, you know, setbacks to it. And that is that even as a student, I realize after I binge that, you know, I could have used that time uh, productively. And I, you know, I, I definitely could have used that time towards my projects that are pending or, you know, towards studying for an exam that I have the next day. So, and there are also physiological setbacks too, right? Um, both of us, we wear glasses and, ex, you know, excessive exposure to screen uh, will give us both headaches. And, but despite that, we've noticed that we continue to binge. Um, so this is our story. Uh, this is the, um, you know, the context of our binging habits. Do you have anything you want to add to that? Um, no, and I, I think you're, you're going to really, um, I think, I hope you relate, actually. We'll, we'll try and uh, kind of take you through the story of uh, what we're trying to do here. But we, we basically don't like binging. You know, uh, we, we've talked about it. There's a great deal of problems that come with binging, a lot of wasting of time. So unsatisfied with binging, we decided to do something about it. So we did some searching. Okay. And what we found in behavioral psychology is that we see this very simple model. I think Ramaji did mention this uh, a couple of weeks back. But what we have is, is that we have a cue, right? Something is happening, right? And something is causing for us to uh, engage in a behavior, right? Whether that be, so if we take the example of brushing your teeth, for example, right? In the morning when we wake up, there's this kind of film of, uh, you know, plaque is what it's called. It's a little a bacterial film that comes on your teeth, right? And what ends up happening is that that's a cue for you to go and brush, right? And now you may ask, so what's the reward in brushing? The reward is that kind of uh, peppy taste that you get in your mouth. You get that nice spearmint taste of insert your brand of toothpaste here, right? And that's that reward that you get. And now for us, after we've done it so many times, we don't think about it so, you know, how do I say it? So cut and dry. We don't see it as oh, I feel the film of bacteria in my teeth, therefore I'm gonna now brush, and now I'm going to expect that reward of mint taste or spearmint or whatever, right? But what this, this is the cut and dry of it behind every response habit that we have, right? Behind every cue and every habit that we do as a cause of that cue, what we see is that there is this model. So that means that with our binging habits, it's the exact same thing. There has to be, have been a cue that's causing us to have a behavior and that's causing us for us to feel a reward, right? So maybe the, the cue could be for her, right? Coming home in the afternoons, right? No one's there, you know, you're in your room alone, had a hard day at school, right? And we need some, you know, we need some rewards, right? It's been a long day. Why don't we just watch some cooking videos or, you know, we can watch some highlights from the last night's game, right? And that causes, that's a cue, right? That time frame is that cue. I wanna make that very specific. That time is the cue, which allows us to then indulge in the behavior of binging. And then the reward is that we feel like, oh, our brain was turned off. We really enjoyed what they were saying, uh, you know, what, what, what the chef was saying, I really enjoyed that uh, slam dunk or what, whatever the, the play was, right? In these sports highlights, we enjoyed those things. And that's the reward there, right? That makes a lot of sense. Right? right, and and clearly we we figured it out actually, guys, and that, that that's all we have to uh, say today, actually. No, he's joking. Totally, he's kidding. joking. Um, but after we came across this across this very you know simple model, we thought, oh, that that makes sense. It makes a lot of sense. Um, but then we had some questions. Um, we thought, but hey, how does this actually work you know what is the the physiological basis of this um what makes us feel good when i watch that diy video or when i watch that tasty cooking video what makes us repeat our habits 
yes, it makes sense. Okay, I had a bad day in school or, or in college. And, you know, that was my cue and I just wanted to escape. So I do it for one day. I binge for one day or yes. But what makes me repeat that habit and makes me do the same thing when I, you know, get a bad grade next the next week? What makes me repeat this binging habit, right? So we started thinking about questions like this and we did some more searching. And uh, we must say, Technology is not on our side today. Right there. Right here, yes. So we did some more searching and we realized that there's actually a neuroscience aspect to the behavioral psychology that we talked about. So these are all big labels right now, but we, we will get into the details in a, in a simple manner so that these huge terms don't seem daunting. Um, so let's take our YouTube binging example again, right? So let's say, you know, uh, it's a rainy day and I've just finished my classes for the day. First time, right? Right, and this is my, uh, um, you know, my first day of classes and I'm taking it easy. I come back to my dorm room. It's just me. Um, or if you're still in school, if you come back home from school and you're all alone at home, um, you know, you think to yourself, hey, it's been a light day at school. I don't have many assignments um, and it's just me at home. So I might as well make this uh, a happy time for myself. So you sit down in front of your tablet of choice uh, or your laptop, and you just open up YouTube. This is your first time. This is the very first time that I um, uh, was exposed to YouTube, let's say like that. Um, so I start watching YouTube, right? I watched this amazing video on how to make a black forest cake. And it is, it is such an enriching experience. I watch it after the video, I feel so happy. And also YouTube has this, uh, amazing feature of autoplay where it'll immediately give you another video to watch. And if you've turned it on and if you've enabled it, it'll give you what, like I think five or less seconds uh, to, and it'll start playing the next video by itself. So you watch a few, I watch a few videos and you know, Black Forest Cake, then I watch, you know, Ratatouille or whatever. And, um, you know, I watched like five videos back to back and the feeling I have after that it feels so good. I feel so happy. I feel like, you know, wow, what a wonderful way to uh, just, you know, increase my happiness level, right? And, and then, so the eyeball here is me watching the YouTube video, and then I feel happy, the smiley face. And then the light bulb here is me integrating this experience into my memory. I may not be, you know, um, like with awareness, I may not be doing this, but sub in the back of my mind, I'll be, I'll remember that, wow, that was such a great time. You know, I was lonely, uh, but you know, I watched five YouTube videos and then I felt so happy. So that will always be in my memory. So it's that integration into my memory that this light bulb um, symbolizes. And then, Let's look at how dopamine is uh, related to all of this. So we, what we just explained right now was the behavioral part of this. But let's see how uh, dopamine is related to this. And before we look at how dopamine is related to this, we want to also mention that dopamine is a very important molecule. And um, some of you may know the term neurotransmitter. It's released in our brains. Um, but essentially, dopamine is really important for motivation, for having the motivation to do uh, certain activities. And it's also important for learning um, new, new activities. Um, so let's go ahead and see how dopamine is involved in this. Go ahead. So in Muktaji's first example, right? She's first sitting down and she's uncovering the world of YouTube, right? So what's happening is that when she comes home in terms of dopamine, right? What we're trying to do um, this is not a scientifically accurate, but it's a general trend of how our dopamine is changing based on what we're doing, right? So she's coming back from school one day, right? 
And what's happening is that her dopamine is at a baseline level, right? But then what happens is that she experiences a cue, right? It's a certain time of day. Now what's happening is that her laptop is there. She's alone. She had a hard day at work and she wants now to enjoy, right? She has a small free time. That gap after class is a cue, right? But I want to make sure that, that we understand that this is an unexpected one. Since it's the first time, right? We can't really call this a cue because it's our first time doing something. We don't know it to be a cue. It's simply uh, a coincidence that these things are happening together. We'll talk a little bit about that uh, in just a second. I know it's a little confusing. Stay with me though. So we have a baseline level. We get to the cue, which she doesn't know is the cue. And then what happens is that she feels that euphoria or that pleasure after watching these five videos back to back. And then her dopamine spikes, right? And if we remember what we said in the last slide, which is that dopamine is an important molecule when it comes to learning and motivation, it makes a little bit of sense, right? Why is it that dopamine is spiking when we're experiencing the reward? It's because when we feel happy, the body wants us to remember that happiness, right? So dopamine is being released for us to learn that, hey, Mukta, this is something that you really enjoy. Think about doing this next time as well. Maybe you'll feel happy, right? That's what the dopamine spike here is doing for us, right? At that reward. So, did you have anything to yes. add? Yes. So, to clarify again, when I feel happy, we're not saying that dopamine is the cause of my happiness. Right. Rather, I feel happy and then dopamine is released to signal to the brain hey, this is a great experience. And it's really important for us to try and repeat the same level of happiness. So let's see if we can uh, make it easier to achieve this level of happiness by making this into a habit. Right. Into something that we don't have to think about, right? Right. So then what happens is, a little complicated, but what happens is that dopamine then says that, hey, remember this, right? Talked about that remembering, remember the reward is important for you, right? This is something you might wanna try again in the future. So the physical implication of that, right? What does that physically do, right? Is that it rewires our brain circuits, right? It says that, hey, remember that. And how that looks in the brain is that two different sections will now be wired together, right? We're now saying that here's the cue, here's the reward, remember this. This is really, really important, right? And what that does for that for us is that now we don't have to think whenever she's sitting alone, she doesn't have to think, oh, what is it that I have to do to feel happy? No, she's got it right there, right? The answer is right there, which is I'm now gonna watch some YouTube, right? Which is to say that that neural circuit is now in place and allows her to thoughtlessly do it in the future, right? It's easier for her to repeat that action in the behavior. Now that dopamine has taught us that this is how we are, this is something that we enjoy. This is something we need to try again, right? So that's, you can probably start to see the inklings of habit beginning to form, okay? Cool. And then the next time happens, right? Monday is done, Tuesday she forgets about YouTube, too, but Wednesday she comes back, another hard day, right? And what happens is that, again, that same time, right? Things that she didn't pick up on the first time, which is the time of day when she watched the YouTube the state of mind she was in when she was watching YouTube, where she was when she was watching YouTube, all those things, dopamine has said, remember those things, those things are gonna help you, those things are cues for you to start watching YouTube. So when she's again, at the end of the day, right after class, she's now tired, it's now in her room, those three cues are met, right? And now she sees that cue again, she remembers that cue, and she's now starting to watch YouTube. See how the thing, ha it has changed. The paradigm has changed the second time, right? No longer is it that we're watching, feeling happy and learning. Now we're using what we learned to start our habit itself, right? Dopamine has taught us that this is something we enjoy. And now we begin to watch YouTube and then we feel happy, right? And we, it's that anticipation of that happiness that gets us to keep, keep moving through this. Right. So if this were to play out in, in my life, which it has, I will remember, oh, on Monday, it was also raining and you know it was also one o'clock and I was also by myself. Today, look outside, it's also raining. Um, and you know again, I don't have much work to do. 
So these are all the cues that Mukund was talking about. These are things that will remind me of what I did on Monday and how I was able to achieve a state of happiness. So dopamine is telling me, you can redo that to try and achieve that same level of happiness. Right, right. and we, we get that happiness as, at the end, right? So that's that keeps us going. That keeps us going through the cycle of, of trying to do this again. So let's, now we, we looked at the behavioral psychology version where we saw the cue, we saw the behavior, and we saw the reward. Now what we're going to do is complicate it just a little for you guys and add in what we just learned about neuroscience, right? And I want to make clear that this is not a causation diagram, right? It's a sequence of events that are happening. We'll specify to you which ones we know to be causing each other. But unfortunately, we don't have the science to tell you that all these things are causing each other. We only know that this happens in sequence. They're correlated, okay? So if one, we have the cue, right? The uh, time of day or the lack of work, right? And what happens is, is that when we have a cue, we see that there's a, a dopamine spike, right? And this is a repeated habit, okay? Mind that as well, right? So we're, we're now, this is the second time we're talking about it. This is how it looks. We have a dopamine spike in, in, in do, dopamine releases. And what that does is that motivates us to go through and find and then do our behavior, right? It motivates us to finish our behavior. And what happens is that when we're doing the behavior, interestingly enough, dopamine levels here, when we are doing our behavior is very, very low compared to when we actually want to do the behavior. The anticipation of the behavior releases a spike of dopamine. But when we are doing the behavior, it's not even close to where it was whenever we're anticipating. An important point. And then after that, right? After we do the work, we, we, we watch YouTube, and then we feel happy, right? At the end of that. Now, dopamine is yet lower, right? Is even lower when we experience the reward and we have a minimum of dopamine there, right? And the cycle repeats, right? Very interesting. Yes. Um, yes, let's go ahead. So, um, so now that we know that dopamine is involved in uh, you know, these, this habit formation. Let's see how habits are sustained, right? So do you remember, if you remember the first time we showed you a similar graph, let's see. So do you remember this graph? This is the first time that I was exposed to YouTube, the very first time. So at this point, YouTube is a new, uh, you know, it's a new Stimulus, thing to me. Right? It's it's novel, and uh, therefore I'm not expecting to get any happiness out of it. So the spike of dopamine occurs when I watch YouTube, but now when I repeat it the second time, what we see is that I'm already anticipating that happiness that I felt the first time I watched uh, a YouTube video. So the dopamine spike actually occurs when I'm anticipating to watch the video. And what's interesting is that, like Mukun said in the previous slide, the dopamine that we feel when we, or dopamine that is released when we actually watch the YouTube video is much, much lower than the dopamine that is released um, when we are actually uh, um, anticipating to watch the YouTube video. And so how does dopamine um, sustain and make this YouTube binging into a habit? So what happens is that you see this spike in dopamine, this feeling of anticipation and craving to watch YouTube video combined with a pleasurable experience when we watch the YouTube video is what sustains and makes this into a continuous loop of habits. Um, and so to give you a contrary example, say you have that anticipation or the craving, um, let's take a different example, uh, coffee. If you, um, let's say it's your second time drinking coffee and you, you get the waft of the coffee beans being grinded and then you are anticipating and craving for that cup of coffee and we have the dopamine spike up in your brain 
And then if you, when you drink the coffee the second time, suddenly it doesn't taste as good. It's an espresso, but you're an Amer Americano person, you know, and it right. just, it just doesn't taste the same. That is no longer a pleasurable experience. Instead, it's, it's a negative one. So that will set, set you back in making that into a habit. But going back to our YouTube example, let's say I watch five more uh, cooking videos and I'm just mind blown. And, you know, I have an amazing uh, experience watching the YouTube video, then this, it'll, it'll combine the two, the dopamine spike and the pleasurable experience will further um, set our habit or further set our, you know, inclination to watch YouTube videos uh, when I have no work or et cetera into stone. Right. So just to show you, um, you know, what would happen is that when you have that reward in the coffee example, and it's not the coffee that you're expecting, what you'll see, and I'll draw this in red for you guys to see, you'll see this, right? Dopamine actually spikes down. And that's exactly what she said, which is that that's a learning that, hey, this is not a pleasurable experience. Don't try this again, right? If you smell this kind of smell, uh, from this kind of place, don't do it. You know, don't go and get that coffee. It's not going to be great for you. So that's how that 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 habit is stopped. But if we have the absence of that spike down, right, and only a positive experience, only you're only getting a good coffee, right? You're getting what you wanted. You went to a different place. You smelled the smell, and you work to get the coffee, and the coffee you wanted is just right, right? Then you don't have that negative spike, and dopamine is telling you, hey, perfect. This is great. Keep doing this. You're going to be happy every time you do this. It's what it's saying, right? It's telling us to keep trying that. Yeah. All right. So that at the fundamental, most simple level is how habits are formed using dopamine. So we've seen that, you know, dopamine, it's not really a feel good molecule as uh, um, some, um, you know, it's a misnomer. Right, right. right. Um, but dopamine is very, very important in forming habits because remember we said it's a, it's a molecule that's important for learning and it's also a molecule important for motivation. So when you are exposed to um, some activity or uh, some object or something that gives you happiness for the first time and you're awestruck by the experience that you get by indulging in that object or food item or whatever it is, dopamine will, will tell your brain, wow, this is a great experience. I want to try and repeat this same level of happiness in the future. So what it will do is it'll, um, it'll make it easier for you to repeat that action without thinking. So the next time, you know, you go to your, uh, um, you know, your bedroom and, you know, it's, again, same scenario. If you have no work, you're again, like Mukun said, you're not thinking, oh, what are my options to make me happy? Instead, dopamine, what it has done for you is it has set the stage already. It's made it easier for you to just go ahead and write, jump into uh, your YouTube app or, or whatever it is. Um, and it allows you to engage in an activity that will try and get you that level of stimulation or that level of happiness. Um, so, and dopamine uh, reinforces that habit uh, because of the spike of uh, dopamine that is released when we anticipate um, the, uh, the activity that we're about to engage in. So every time we finish um, binging YouTube for a day, we'll, you know, we'll be looking forward to binging YouTube again, given the cues are the same the next day, right? So on to some interesting points. Yeah. You want to go for it? Sure. So there's two kind of interesting points that we want to talk about uh, when it comes to dopamine. And one is novelty, right? Uh, I think uh, we all know that where we started in terms of a human species, right? We were hunter hunter gatherers, right? We would forage a lot. And this idea has been hardwired, this idea of a interest or a uh, preference for the unknown, right? Is helpful in a lot of ways for us because it allows us to survive, right? So as hunter gatherers, when we'd go into the forest to find berries for us to eat, right? If we didn't find berries, right? 
what does that mean? That we, we, we wouldn't be able to survive, right? And if we if we did not have a predilection or a dis uh, or a liking for this novelty and for the unexpected, then we wouldn't go out to the forest again, trying to get berries the next time. Does that make sense? So it's our ability to uh, really enjoy the unexpected. When things are unexpected, it gives us a great deal of joy, right? And it's that it's the fact that uh, you know such the survival can be so important, unexpected, the unexpected nature of life, right? When we go out to the forest and we're looking for berries, right? We don't know if we're gonna find them or not, but it's our liking to find the unexpected or our liking to experience the unexpected that keeps us alive and motivates us. We didn't get berries this time, but hey, we'll try again next time, right? So dopamine is actually, we see that dopamine, there's more dopamine release in activities where we don't know what the reward is going to be, right? So if, if we're jumping into a roller coaster for the first time and we have no idea how it runs, right? And those kind of scenarios, we see that dopamine spike is much higher than if we have something that we know will produce a reward, right? So if I know that, uh, for example, there's a ride I go on a lot, right? It's a kiddie, kiddie ride because I'm personally afraid of roller coasters. Uh, you know, I know very well, hey, I'm going to be happy. It's going to be good. I know how well that's going to be. That's an expected reward, right? So I, I can get onto that roller coaster and the dopamine spike happens at that queue, right? I see the board for the roller coaster. I decide I'm gonna ride it. You see the regular spike, right? But what happens is that I see this brand new roller coaster that's in town, right? And man, that look, that, it looks really scary, but also very exciting, right? Because I don't know what it's going to be like. What we see is, is that dopamine is much higher. It's released in a much higher level, motivating me to try what I don't know, right? So that's something interesting when it comes to Netflix or it comes to checking your email or binging YouTube, we have no idea what shows they're gonna make for us. We have no idea what the next YouTube recommended video is going to be. You know, and if we're a little older, we have no idea what email is gonna pop up into our inbox next, right? So that's what keeps us binging. That was, that's what keeps us going in that cycle, right? We don't know what's going to be next, and we hope that it's going to be really great. And that hope that it's going to be really great through dopamine is what's keeping us in that cycle. That's an, something to think about, right? Something to think about, especially when it comes to binging things that give us novel content like Netflix and YouTube, right? All right. And now we'll talk about the law of diminishing returns. This one is really, really interesting because um, it gives us a lot of insight into uh, dopamine and its mechanism, and it's that as we continue to repeat um, a behavior, so say if it's coffee, right? Um, as we drink coffee again and again, what we don't realize is that we may not take away happiness the same level that we experienced the first time. So let's say it's our you know 10th cup of coffee the same week we first started drinking coffee. While dopamine motivates us to continue drinking coffee, you may not, uh, observe this in your life too, but according to the law of diminishing returns and you know the very nature of habits, we realize that that 10th cup of coffee actually doesn't give us the same level of happiness that we experienced when we drank the first cup of coffee. And that's because, and it ties into novelty as well, because this is no longer a novel experience. We already have an expectation of what this happiness is going to be like. Um, but again, that's how dopamine, it keeps motivating us to repeat the, ha the habits again and again, because it has made us think that we can achieve the same level of happiness when we repeat that habit again. But that's not true. Unfortunately, the we will never. Uh, it, it is difficult to achieve the same level of happiness uh, when we repeat something again, right? You want to go for it? And that's a strength, right? Dopamine has nothing to do with happiness, right? It's taking what we think is happiness, what we feel is happiness, and telling us to do it again. So that's where maybe we can try and you know shimmy in and think and say maybe I'm craving to do this because you know my brain thinks it's something that I enjoy. But do I really, like sitting for the 10th night in a row and it's 2 a.m. and I'm watching YouTube, my eyes hurt, I didn't get any work done, I'm not getting good sleep, right? Then that's where you have the opportunity to question and see, is this just my body being inclined to do things over and over again because it's something that I did in the beginning? 
or am I really enjoying this, right? Because it's up to us to experience that happiness. Dopamine has no control over our happiness, right? Simply telling us what we think is happy. So that's where we have that ability to control that. And that's where we urge you to do some thinking as well. Definitely, yes. Okay, so this is, this is also another interesting takeaway. And um, so let's say that we're trying to um, observe our eating habits, right? Um, so let's say I have a salad for lunch. It's my, again, my first week at school. I forgot to take, um, you know, ho uh, my lunch bag from home. So um, I'm eating, I'm choosing to eat a salad at school. Uh, I don't know <laughs> which child would do that, but uh, I did. And um, what we see here is that the, on the scale of happiness, right? There's enhanced happiness, then there's normal happiness, and we have here suboptimal happiness, or just um, you know a lower level of happiness than compared to normal, right? So we're gonna say that for now, when I'm eating this salad, my level of happiness is just gonna be at baseline. It's gonna be normal. Let's say I forgot to bring my lunch again the next day at school. This time I see the, you know, the sumptuous options that the cafeteria provides. Um, again, that may not be the case at all cafeterias, but I see that they have this beautiful pizza waiting for me. It's a little greasy, but it looks very uh, enticing. So I opt for the pizza on, on uh, this day of the week. And you know, I sit down and I'm, I'm taking the pizza to my mouth. And this is my first time ever having pizza, okay? <laughs> And I, I yeah, right. chomp down on that pizza and I eat it. And man, oh man, my pleasure center in my brain just goes, hey, why? <laughs> and I am just experiencing an out of body experience, but the happiness level is, is enhanced. So you see an, a peak of happiness. Again, this is happiness, not dopamine. Right. We're talking about levels of happiness here. So I'm having this amazing feeling and because of this pizza, right? So I, and I, nowadays, because of this pizza, I'm just purposely forgetting to bring my lunch from home because I want to eat that pizza again at the school cafeteria. Um, so it's Wednesday and again, I engage in my pizza eating uh, activity. And interestingly, we find that that happiness, although the craving for it, is very like I I can't go to sleep that night because I want to have that pizza again. Like that craving is uh, it's um, it's very intense and it's very significant. But when we when we actually sit down to you know put that pizza back into our mouth and we eat the pizza again, you may really like, uh, no, observe this in your life too. But I've seen that the happiness that I get out of my you know second time of eating ha uh, pizza or, or whatever it is is actually um it be what it becomes in this case it becomes the it, it is it is lessened definitely from my first time of eating happiness but when we compare this happiness to let's say oh let's go ahead to sure. let's say we eat a salad the next day because i run out of lunch money and i can only afford a salad on thursday and when i eat the salad i just experience such a low in my happiness. And this is because I'm comparing my happiness from a salad to the happiness that I received from eating a pizza. So you can see now that my baseline of happiness has become eating pizza. So when I eat a salad, obviously it's going to be much lower because I'm comparing it to, to the standards of pizza eating, is it not? So what you can see here, this, this can actually become dangerous, right? Yeah. So what, what, what can actually happen is that, like I said just a little earlier, is that we keep trying to, you know, recreate this happiness from that out-of-body pizza experience, but our, we are not feeling happy, you know? What's driving us to do this again and again is separate from the happiness we experience, right? And we can be stuck here, right? And at what cost? Is that cheese and gluten and the tomato paste, is that doing any good? No, it's not, right? So what happens is that we get stuck in a habit that's not healthy for us, right? And it's something that we think gives us pleasure, right? Because we've been wired to do it again and again. Very, very dangerous, right? But what happens is that this dip, right? 
this dip because we're eating salad on Thursday, right? This is uh, non junk food, I believe, is what the N stands for. So right. when I when I'm uh, you know on Thursday, I, I'm choosing after two days of eating junk food, mind you, I'm going back to that salad which doesn't have any cheese, no gluten, you know, no tomato paste. All it's green. just green. It has a weird crunchy sound to it. I'm going to feel bad, right? Because it's not that pizza. My pleasure is suboptimal. I don't know if you can read that. You can, right? Suboptimal, right? Your pleasure is suboptimal. So what we're saying to you, though, is that, look, look at Friday, though. You're back to where you were on Monday. If you can suffer through, not really suffer, but if you can sit through that discomfort of eating that salad on Thursday, by Friday, when you get to lunch, what you'll see, results may vary, but what you'll see is that you will feel as happy as you did on Monday, and now you're making a healthy choice for your body as well, right? You have effectively broken the cycle that dopamine has put you in, trying to achieve a happiness that's not going to come back, and now you're choosing to push past that junk happiness, if I may say that, and reach this vegetable happiness, right? This uh, salad happiness that we're getting to on Friday, right? And we're saying that if you can push through that, right, that Thursday and get to Friday, it's now you're on the right path doing something healthy for you. And it's also something that you can be no at a normal happiness level with, right? Right. And one more point I'd like to add is that, remember, now we know that the happiness that we get from uh, engaging in an activity of pizza eating for the first time, this spike of happiness is temporary. And like we said, we, it, it is difficult to achieve that high of a happiness again when we repeat that. But also keep in mind, this low is also temporary. So when you're trying to get out of your pizza eating habit or whatever habit you may please, we re realize that the, the dull or the, you know, the, the conflict that you feel within you um, that, that is temporary. And if you, if you can persevere through that, you'll realize that you will actually, actually uh, come back to your uh, previous set point. Right. And this is an idea by Dr. Douglas Lyle. Always have to give credibility to where credit where credit is due. So he, he's written a book called The Activity Trap. And it's a, it details things like this. So if you're interested, just wanted to drop that for you as well. Um, Yes, good. Yeah. So this is also another uh, method where we can um, combat uh, dopamine and use dopamine actually to its um, our to our advantage. Um, so it's a simple regimen, um, uh, and this was actually uh, not our own idea. This has been um, this is the idea of a, a, a University of California uh, professor. Um, and the basic rules of this is uh, you uh, choose to forego any high dopamine activity. So this can include binging, YouTube, or video games. Um, you can choose to not do that for, and you set a time period. So let's say I'm going to promise myself from 6 a.m. to uh, 6 p.m. I will not engage in any high dopamine act uh, activities. Um, but what I will do is I will focus on what I have now come to think of as low dopamine activities. So that may include studying or uh, folding clothes or um, cleaning the rooms. Yeah, exactly. So these are, again, low dopamine activities because we're comparing these activities to the high, you know, the, the happiness that we feel from the high dopamine activities. So, and actually this professor suggests, you know, I'll, I will do, um, you know, for every hour or, uh, of, uh, or every four hours of low dopamine activity, I will do an, one hour of high dopamine activity after 6 p.m., let's say, if that's our uh, routine. Right, and uh, right, this, it's, a, it's an interesting topic, dopamine detox. Definitely look more into it. There has been some you know, pushback against it, but we will, what we'll say is that there's an, import, there's an important point, there's an important nuance or a specificity that we want to point out, right? And the reason why psychologists have gotten very, very angry with this topic, or there's a little uh, level of maybe controversy there, is because uh, the results, right? People are saying that 
um, or the psychologists are understanding it that people are trying to stop an activity one day and that is allowing them to effectively, uh, you know, do more low dopamine activities and entirely tear themselves away from high dopamine activities. That's not the case, right? Progress is a journey, is a, is a very, very, very gradual journey, right? Sometimes it may take eight to 10 months, 12 months, maybe more than one year, right? For us to be able to, to be able to really change our high dopamine activities for good and be able to come to a low dopamine activity, right? By fasting, we're not suggesting that your baseline dopamine levels are going up or down because of that, right? Simply foregoing high dopamine activities will allow you to forego that spike that you get from that high dopamine activity and pursuing low dopamine activities will allow you to have a lower spike, right? So there's a little bit of uh, specificity there, but I think the idea as we're presenting here as a long-term process, right? is something that we can definitely use. And we see that it augurs really well with uh, things like ekadashi vratam, or like fasting that we do in, uh, during ekadashi, right? Uh, every 11 days uh, of the lunar calendar, what, what happens, what, what the Shastras say is that we, we take a fast, right? And uh, that there's a, that's a, that's a low dopamine activity, right? Uh, every four, uh, yes, 15 days, sorry, thank you. Every 15 days, uh, we take a fast. So sometimes it's maybe twice a month or once a month. Um, and what that allows us to do is it allows us to be mindful of the fact that we're foregoing things, right? That the extreme version, um, if you're able to do of the Ekadashi fast would be to, uh, you know, not even drink water, right? Just stay the whole day without any water or any food. Um, you know, others all try just water, others do just drinks uh, and, and no food. And then others yet do no rice. And there's much, a lot of variety. But what we're coming to say is that we're trying to let go of a staple food that we're eating, right? And that's allowing us to take something simpler, right? So if I'm eating a lot of food, uh, you know, pizza and all this wonderful stuff, then when it comes to Ekadashi, I'm only drinking water. All of a sudden, my only consumption for that day is water, right? So my perspective is now changing from, oh, uh, I'm eating pizza on Monday, Tuesday, I have to eat salad. I'm feeling that sadness, right? But rather what's happening is that now, Monday, I'm eating pizza. Tuesday is Ekadashi, and I ate nothing, right? And now, Wednesday, I'm happy to eat a salad, right? Because I didn't eat anything on Tuesday. I'm now happy to eat even a salad on Wednesday, right? Our perspective shifts a little bit through those things. So the, there's definitely a scientific uh, aspect to all this. Adamaji always says, right, there's three axes with which we can see anything in Sanatana Dharma, right? And just like that, what we see is with the Vrata as well, there's there's many axes we can look at. There's a, a spiritual aspect and also a very well proven um, psychological aspect to it as well. Yeah. Right. So with that being said, all of that was meant to kind of convey to you that at the root of our habits, whether they may be productive or not, um, uh, is dopamine. And if we feel, you know, sad or if we feel regrets that we are engaging in an unproductive habit, at the end of the day, we can remind ourselves, hey, it's, a, you know, it's a biological molecule in my brain that has um, encouraged me to follow this and make it into a habit. And we can, you know, at the end of the day, we, we are given some agency when we see through the workings of dopamine, when we realize I am not getting the same happiness that I am expecting to get the same, the expecting to get. And maybe we can, you know, that gives us the power, the, and it empowers us to, to um, take an action against unproductive habits uh, per se. Um, uh, and I think that's, that's a very powerful mindset that we can get when we understand that at the end of the day, it's really just a 12 carbon molecule with two hydroxy groups and an amine group that is, um, you know, at the root cause of, you know, me partaking in these habits. Yes, and so, so these are just small things, small tidbits that we thought were really helpful. And I, I, we, I mean, I, I'm pretty sure Mukun joins me in saying this as well, and that we think that it'll be really helpful for you too, um, you know. So next time you binge watch, uh, you know, DIY video on YouTube, I can only speak for uh, myself. Uh, just think to yourself: Am I getting that same level of happiness that I'm expecting to? And you know, am I choosing to do this, or am I engaging in this activity without thinking, uh, because dopamine has allowed me to do this activity without thinking? So something to think about. Yeah. Okay.
Right. And uh, thank you as always to Ramuji. He's uh, taken his time to really discuss these ideas with us and kind of help us understand them ourselves. And it's been a really wonderful journey getting to learn that. And it's always an, uh, a joy to be able to share with the family what we learned. So thank you all for patiently listening as well. We hope that it was of uh, some use. We'll hand it over to Ramuji. Thanks to the future doctors, Mukund and Mukta, for enlightening us on this uh, eight carbon molecule thing. Okay. And uh, the beauty with this is people like me come from a background where we are able to appreciate both the spiritual aspect of self improvement and self discovery the psychological aspect of self-improvement and self-discovery, and also to find the physiological basis. Physiology, now what happens in the body, which augurs with a psychology, which augurs well with spirituality, which augurs well with religion, you see? So more I, I you know, personally see those things and hear about these things, more excited I am, and the more uh, the love I have for this Sanatana Dharma. I'll give you some small applications. They already mentioned one of Ekadasi. Once when I was in Pune for some visit, I met an interesting person who is a taster. <laughs> you see, he's a coffee taster. So he goes around various coffee plantations and other stuff. And his job is to taste coffee. And he told me something interesting. Uh, between two tastings, is supposed to gargle with a mild saline. <laughs> you see? Because the first tasting will come in the way of accurately tasting coffee after, say, 10 minutes or 15 minutes, because uh, the previous tasting influences the next tasting. So he says, best way to taste afresh is to bring in a not so tasty stuff in between. <laughs> which is nobody likes uh, gargling with saline water. It is not even honey and all that, right? So he does this gargling so that he can taste the second coffee and feel the same taste which he felt was the first coffee. And uh, that was very interesting. And that clearly shows that uh, two things. One, when you have a high stimulation, all the dopamine all too technical for me, stimulation. There is so much of stimulus around me, so much of triggers around me, so much promises around me. And that's why I am telling we should not lead a mediocre life. If we lead a mediocre life, we'll be played. People will take us for a ride. When I say people, I don't mean uh, personal people. The whole society, this advertisement, marketing, the ambience, my phone, my uh, iPad, you know, the, the online presence, everything is designed to manipulate my decisions. I'm convinced about it. It's not a conspiracy theory. This is how they design. We have some people in our uh, satsang who design games. Na? So the way they design games is, how do I make it engaging? So that sounds pretty nice. But the other side of how do I make it engaging means, how do I make a person crave to continue the game? For example, if there is, I believe there is something called Candy Crush, you see? Not the real Candy Crush, but it's an e-Candy Crush. And I know our satsangi in Chennai, who given five minutes, is busy doing something. I said, my goodness, you're working overtime today. And he showed me all this round, this square, pink, blue, all these candy crush stuff, candy crush saga. Saga. <laughs> and it started, and he was doing that, and it was automatic. I could see it, you see? And uh, that's how it is designed. Hats off to those genii <laughs> who are technically uh, uh, all these geniuses who actually, uh, you know, uh, designed this wonderful stuff to make it very engaging. That's their intelligence. Hats off to them. Nothing against them. But I also need to be intelligent, which means I need to maneuver through these distractions and manipulations and so much stimulus around me into my own journey of life towards my own purpose. So the way my earlier generation used to do it is by complete faith, you see? So in Tamil, we say, the elders say, and we say, this is what is the practice, so do it. 
and uh, a generation or two before me had conviction in the words of elders because elders were elders in character in maturity in sacrifice in penance so their words had value eh? uh, i consider myself also not an elder but i'm just saying then the generation came elders lost a little bit of their penance they lost a little bit of their sacrifice they lost a little bit of their spiritual power or whatever but then they had a hold over the next generation so the generation obeyed their elders out of fear out of respect even though the conviction was not sent down then our generation came which is very close to your generation but still you know, just a few you know decades or whatever so in our generation we were absolutely unconvinced by what the elder said yet we were nice people we didn't want to hurt them so we went through the motions of obeying the elders you see that's what we did just to make sure that i keep them in good humor you see and i was interested personally in tell me why how does it impact my mind if i do japa what does it give me for my mind <laughs> but now we have a very inquisitive generation which can accept nothing less than science and uh, stuff which can be verified or to put it very simply stuff which their school teachers tell you <laughs> see and that's where i find me personally i have seen these three generations and i'm living in the best of all times because i have a little background only little obviously it's a ocean a religion is a ocean spirituality is an ocean i have a little background of the religion and because i worked in a company and they put me through some training and all this workshops i have a little uh, very little uh, of psychology and now we are in a age where incredible discovery it's all available on the internet all you need to do is search you see seek and uh, there if you go into that uh, internet they are giving so much information uh, which we were not privy to a generation back we have to go to british council library in chennai no to go but you know or american central library and the airs they throw not the american library yeah. british library <laughs> so you do you can't do this you can't take this you can't take this there keep quiet and now tamil la kupra padutundu padikalam i bad now we have everything available here then i was curious if so much information so much knowledge whatever you want is available not only scientific facts a very rare sanskrit text which was published in 1875 available if you search and if you are persistent in your search once uh, uh, this what happened our swami ji asked me kanchi mahapiriva spoke to an australian couple something about ego what is sitni asked i looked at him blankly he said internet go search you <laughs> see and he took me about half an hour but i found it exact words of periva it was hidden under four five layers of a scribed or you know scribed in it clearly adu kulla irukku and i needed to upload something so i uploaded some very interesting file and you know got this file out exact words were there the australian couple asked uh, why is uh, god who is very compassionate having uh, a world with so much of illusion maya etc and kanchi mahapriya replied uh, illusion is because of ego which is eve in turn evil but necessary for our spiritual growth this is what he said whatever it means okay it's little deep but it was available the reason why i was telling you this is so much is available in internet so what you do expect that now the general intelligence of people should have really been enhanced now right but then i read it again in internet that internet merely made smart people smarter and dumb people dumber that's the word they used i am not trying to use any judgment here why because as much as there is genuine wonderful knowledge for our inner growth and for auto growth and all that there is also this lot of uh, pisas in it you see there is lot of junk also there 
which is distracting, which is supposed to be titillating, so, so much of stimulus, et cetera. So we have a medium, which, which is how you are reaching to me now and I am reaching to you right now, right? But the medium is a double-edged sword, you see? And so unless I am conscious about how this medium can manipulate and distract me, I get played, which means I lose something very precious, which is my life. And uh, which is, I have a tremendous potential to live an exemplary life, which means a life which is completely devoid of distraction and manipulation by, you know, others, who are the others is. I can lead an original life, you see, but I need to be conscious about it. The way in which we were conscious few generations back, at least from Indian perspective, Sanatana Dharma is, is purely by elders have said that, rishis have said that, so I do that. And then somewhere this faith was shaken. And then it became more like it gives me peace, so I'm doing it. So it's more psychological. But now our current generation, they are happier and more convinced if you can explain it to a physiological level because that's what they study, you see? And so when I looked at this uh, chemical stuff which it is doing, which augurs well with Siddha philosophy of they say Sorakardan Rolya, like you have udders for the cow. They say there are four udders in your head which can actually milk you uh, the joy. You see, when you read Siddha's literature, like you have a funny way of naming stuff, dopamine. Huh? Suppose I come from a non-English background, what a name have you kept in a dopamine? You won't understand, right? Likewise, Siddha's have their own uh, language. They say there is a nala manga, and although we use the word even the Siddha literature the Tenga, manga, it comes from Siddha literature. Manga means mango. Tenga means coconut. So generally we add a head to that and you know, we actually, uh, you know, uh, we, <laughs> we chide people hmm? saying that in you know, manga, tenga, it all comes from Siddha literature. This color. And so all these scientific improvements, even if it's a little trite for us to even get into it is good for us to understand these things because it enhances our power when you realize what is happening when you're craving. When you're craving, if you are an observer, which means if you understand that craving is not me, it is merely a chemical playing in my head, then uh, I have more power to type through the craving when I understand the mechanism of this craving better. You see? And now the current generation needs physiology to support our age-old fantastic practices. And one example is that of Ekadasi. Let's start with food. There are two things I have learned from this uh, science of happiness and uh, the science of breaking unhappiness. I'll give you both the examples. Science of happiness says, if something is unbridled, some source of happiness, which means I have a chocolate parlor in my kitchen. Huh? You're going to be a very miserable, I can't use that word now, heavy person. Because there is absolutely no limits around you picking a chocolate and eating. It may appear to be, I have tremendous choice, tremendous freedom, etc. It is not going to give you that. It's as simple as that. The science of happiness says happiness gives you the maximum, can I use the word high, only when it comes with a boundary. When it comes with a boundary, as now you get it, now you go and get it. That type of happiness gives you the real happiness. Rest is all indulgence. And even that pleasure follows this economics rule called law of diminishing returns. It, if, if there was one thing I learned from my four years of engineering and it sort of stayed with me for the rest of my life, it is this law of diminishing returns. I, I studied in Delhi University. And uh, there was a lady, a very young lady, who came from the campus of Delhi University to teach we engineers economics. Can you imagine her plight? This was just, you have to sit through that class because it was humanities. And we engineers, you know, with all this... Uh, 
a gaussian transformation laplace transformation what is all this economics macro micro and all that so she had to make it very interesting and she was extremely good psychologist so in the first class her name i still remember was ms madumdar okay the first class she came she talked about a paradoxes in economics and it sort of caught our interest because it was you know thinking thing the paradox of when you reduce the cost of essential commodities huh? or when you increase the cost of a luxury item in economics for example for me rice wheat etc is all uh, you know uh, essential and suppose you have extremely rare side dishes and some exquisite uh, vegetable or something like that on the side it is said when you actually increase the cost of that stuff out there the demand of it increases if you reduce the cost of rice the demand of rice reduces generally when you reduce the cost demand has to increase na when essential part of your meals cost is reduced consumption is reduced and they were all baffled how is it possible then they found out since you reduce the cost of rice now they have extra money to buy those things which are tasty in the side na so they bought less rice so that they can enjoy this extra tasty side dish more so all your economic models of lower cost to more demand etc won't work and there are some paradoxes that's how she started and then she taught us about law of diminishing returns and she taught us with that's the beauty of a great teacher she taught us with tremendous conviction that it stayed with the entire batch we were all about uh, about 40 electrical engineers to this day we remember that rule because we started seeing everywhere she talked only about economics but uh, we could relate it to coffee drinking we could relate it to our you know binging everything that each time i repeat something more and more and more the satisfaction or the value it adds to me keeps dropping all the time you see and the, the initial fancy the initial high i have when i try something new or something novel won't sustain so we need to design that that way which means our shastras very beautifully bhagavan sri krishna tells that to uddhava the idea of putting rules and restrictions is twofold right first one is only when you put a boundary around something which is very pleasurable it will retain its pleasure when it is repeated that's why they have a time uh, boundary space boundary and a person boundary to anything which is pressurable anything huh? and they made it so that you don't lose the fancy or the value of the pleasurable item that's the lower alpha huh? the higher one is suppose at some point of time you decide to kick a habit huh? when we follow a boundary in indulging in something it's easy for us to come out of it because the craving level would always be in check because i am not allowing it to unbridled unbridled na without control decide what i do you see so when i make this boundary as a, a way of life which was the state of sanatana dharma earlier i had tremendous power over myself and i also had extremely pleasurable life forget happiness joy ananda let it come later the pleasure was also joyful because there were boundaries and since there were boundaries and i respected the boundary the looking forward was kept in check but the value of the satiation was still giving me that happiness because i was interspreading all this with so called routine work also things which i like or not i do many times they say no follow your passion follow your passion i am not a big fan of that you also follow your passion and you also be ready to do some dreary work in between otherwise passion fashion are gad you see you need to interspread the so called emotional high stuff with relishable routine work and do you know who the uh, i have a friend you know he is a philosopher friend a very funny fellow and uh, he is no more okay he was long back no more <laughs> and in fact he died even before i was born his name is clemens he comes from this part of the country huh? but he wrote a nice book for me when i studied in my school it was called adventures of tom sawyer he was also known as mark twain by the way 
So this uh, Tom Sawyer, I remember an interesting uh, episode in Tom Sawyer's book. It is the defining moment in any Tom Sawyer book. Uh, you, uh, I think the friend's name is Ben. Ben is what I remember. Ben or Rogers or something. And he had an aunt. And obviously it is Polly. And the aunt Polly told Tom Sawyer, you are a mischievous fellow, go and paint the fence. Uh, this Tom Sawyer, genius of that guy. So he was painting. And then this Ben comes in. His name is Ben. He comes and says, Tom, punishment. Eh? The Tom said, wait, can't you see I'm working here? Then he whistled. He's painting a wall. You see, you can do it with your eyes closed. And it's a punishment, supposedly. This Tom Sawyer fellow, <laughs> he's putting one brush of paint out there. It's mm, fantastic. Well done, Tom. French license. Eh? So he started painting again. And then Ben said, Tom, what are you doing? I heard Aunt Polly punished you. Punishment, my goodness. Aunt Polly trusted this job only to me because I'm the best painter in town. The Ben said, do you want some help? No. How can I ever share that? Get up. Let me focus. And he was happy. And the Ben got very intrigued. So this chap is really enjoying painting. And he made it appear so joyful. The Ben said, hey, yaar, hey, ek bar de do, yaar. Ben was from Delhi. So, <laughs> so the Ben said, give me one chance. You see, I had a small reunion with my hostelers today. It's all running there. And so Ben said, give me a chance. And Tom said, nothing doing. How can I give that to you? And then finally, Ben was pleading, begging, <laughs> craving. And finally, Tom said, what will you give if I give you this? I'll give you an apple. And Tom took an apple, sat down happily munching it. And Ben is actually enjoying the painting. You see? And that is what is finding enjoyment in even, you know, painting the fence. And very beautifully, my friend says uh, that work is what your body is obliged to do. Play is what your body is not obliged to do. Remember the have to, etc. The moment you make everything as an have to, I have to kick the habit, na, work. Uh, maybe I can kick this habit. Or if you make it, maybe I need to kick this habit. It is play for you. The moment you make it compulsory, moment you need to exert willpower without that consciousness or this being a witness and understanding, anything becomes work for you. But the moment I understand it's not obliged, but I choose to do it, it becomes play. So Tom Sawyer converted a very uh, drudgery, uh, normal, trite, mundane, regular work into something fun. Whether he manipulated or not, secondary. But for Ben, it was really fun. He felt very happy doing it, you see. And that is what comes when we understand what's happening in me because it's my body. And uh, for some of us, we don't need to understand all this. As I said, there are three ways of understanding this. If we can understand and have faith, for example, it's very simple. How do we get that faith? Uh, we take the story of a saint or a Puranic uh, hero. Huh? And then we say, he did this, he got this. She did this, she got that. So I'll do it, I'll get it. Very simple life we all have. But it may not work with everybody. Na. The people are very different. So we need a little psychological model to that, which is what I was trying to do along with our you know, role models. And now today, I thought we'll experience. What is there to do? We have to experience. And since we are only chatting, it's not an official lecture. There is no obliged. You're not obliged to listen. I'm not obliged to talk. So it's play. For you, it is play to listen. Nobody's taking attendance. Though secretly, I suspect somebody is doing it here. But you know, don't worry. Nobody is doing it. And uh, I'm not obliged to speak. I love to. Because it helps me to think through stuff. And more than everything, he, our master, asked us to explore how do we enhance our day-to-day -day living to a higher level so that we can enjoy, uh, you know, this life, our, uh, this day-to-day -day activities, and also the activities which we do, which are religious and spiritual. So it's a whole package. 
you can't say i enjoy my spiritual activities but i'm a very dreary person after the puja is over then there is something wrong there is only one life and we have to make our whole life a divine celebration that is the reason why swami ji gave such wonderful topics on saturdays to talk it's more a chat it's not a toastmasters performance out here so obviously you know we, we are just having a discussion out here and and that's why we thought uh, these two were actually very passionate about researching that it is better to listen from the horse's mouth isn't it? and uh, that is the reason why they presented they did an excellent job they, they just presented you a small portion of what they researched they had a humongous research below it and that gave me three four things huh? uh, what i reflected uh, is just like how you need a saline between the two consecutive tasting just like how our little krishna asked that mommy give me a side dish while having that uh, chakrapongal huh? that uh, sweet dish he says give me a side dish ena appo da adu balance aagum you see just chakra pongal is called saturation and you get the tagato saturation but for that you need a little bit of this which means i relish my regular dreary work as a lovely background to the enjoyable stuff which i am going to anyway do if i don't do this dreary work or what i quote as dreary that enjoyment i get from this so called stimulants is not going to give me that enjoyment so it is very important that i have a balance and understanding of my so called routine chores without complaining etc because without that the so called pleasurable activities will makes no sense at all you see what i'm saying all the beauty of foreground and background huh? and so once i understand this i relish it and over time you know what happens i don't need a stimulant at all then i start enjoying this it start giving me the joy and no more work for me 24 by 7 play for me. it's possible trust me it's possible you can make everything play if we have the right understanding about why i am doing it how is it fitting in my journey of purpose or purpose of journey or whatever then everything becomes play for me everything gives me joy and uh, there is no craving it means i look forward to stuff which means i am not obliged you see and uh, i do it and i enjoy it and i choose to do it i need to do it i enjoy it i don't have to do anything this way i always choose to do and need to do if i don't understand my grand purpose i have to do a lot of things you see which is not going to make even the so called what did you say i took my family for a movie yaar what is that how you report a pleasurable event like you say i got married here no it's not how you see it right so the whole idea of you know uh, our system of you know balancing these two like ekadasi na higher standard is depending on our uh, physiological state no water no food na it it's like saline it resets our sensations of taste sensations of smell sensations of sight etc so during dwadashi have you noticed the actual uh, traditional meal during dwadashi first of all they don't add tamarind for obvious reasons that if it's too much you know uh, too much of tamarind etc you'll have a little problem with your uh, stomach which is starving for one full day so instead of tamarind they introduce lemon for pulipu uh, for this little uh, taste of sourness they have Uh, nellika nellika means gooseberry uh, the, the wild gooseberry to give you the sense of a mixture of bitterness sourness which results in sweetness later and then they have a spinach called agathigira which is positively bitter you see but they are making you taste the whole fair and you are very happy tasting all this because for 24 hours you have not had a square so you enjoy your bitterness and you're surprised my goodness i never thought i enjoy bitterness whenever our children in satsang says i don't like it when they don't try i feel very sorry for them you see it is okay to have things which are not palatable if it is good for you what's there bitterness is part of it and to that extent our elders ensure you experience all emotions of life all hues of life and during the first day of the new year in south india during the tamil new year's day or ugadi or uh, you have this uh, 
start of the new year you know which comes somewhere in march april do you know what they actually give you <laughs> they give you the flower of a neem tree neem tree nale kasakal that flower of the neem tree they make a small pachadi they make uh, you know their pachadi means uh, whatever gulash <laughs> so they make vegetarian gulash out of it okay and then you have this rasam soup hmm? from that leaf and they have all the tastes saying let this new year like in china i believe there is a proverb let you live in interesting times is what they say it is seen as a curse a blessing it is a mixture of both you see likewise they are saying may you live your life fully which means may you experience all the hues of taste all the rasa rasa dane all the rasa relishes of life a koncham sokam irukano a little bit of anandam irukano little pleasure fine little pain let it be there it's, it's so they make us not to cherry pick so the craving does not take us over so they make us exposed to all that ivlagu including our food design is they say i want only this i want only this now you are not explored life at all you lead a very one leg the life you see partial life and you are not tasted it and that is the reason why they give that taste and in the dwadashi they give you the taste of all the six rasas and then it's a reset and you will be very surprised each dwadashi you will be surprised that bitterness is what i really you know i thought i will i will just spit it out along right as out let's see and that is the beauty of this once in 15 days reset and then there are practices like you know that in india everything goes along with religion it's inseparable every saturday some have the practice of skipping a dinner <laughs> so that's one way of doing i used to do it. when we were children as saturday as a mark of respect to balaji or religion but when you skip a meal that's a reset for you stomach to say next day morning whatever comes in my plate i'm going to eat it you see which means uh, that craving is not for something which is stimulant that craving becomes what it is supposed to be for which is to fulfill my need you see of food and that's how they designed it and second thing if you go to a very orthodox home which i am very afraid to go they actually say while you eat pesa <laughs> de don't talk while you eat you can't even talk while you eat imagine ipad iphone etc you see why no you believe it or not you have to spend 1000 dollars to get that lesson it is called mindful eating sadu bhavi 1000 dollar na how much i owe to my mother grandmother and all that for making me mindfully eat by saying don't talk because they say you are eating at least during eating which is the fundamental need of a human pay respect to the fulfillment of the need and don't again wait for some other stimulation for you to even eat sapar dev or stimulant <laughs> and we want a stimulant to forget this stimulant so they said don't even talk focus on what you eat focus on the gratitude when you eat and i bet in another 5 6 years some of this uh, peptologist stomachologist intestinologist all this is to na paam padichirukka adan panna vendama they will actually show us that if you mindfully eat your enzymes have a better quality or enzymes are better secreted and the digestion is that's 10 million you owe me <laughs> right now <laughs> with all the research i know it because you try this now one week you eat mindfully one week you eat with all these you know stimuli you will see the difference in the way in which it is digested the way you feel etc that is what they showed us and that's the practice and uh, uh, remember this it's a paradox when there is limits to pleasurable activities it enhances the pleasure it's a researched fact i will i will give you the name of the person he is another incredible positive psychologist you see he is he has done research on a lot of positive psychology stuff when you put borders and boundaries around pleasurable activities it actually heightens the experience which is what we want anyway otherwise it heightens the expectation and disappoints you see that's what happens the craving is there but uh, i can get no satisfaction <laughs> you see that's what happens finally and that is the reason why they have put rules for everything shravanama don't add salt because salt is another junk na 
it has to be kept with the right proportion too much salt is again a problem you all know that you see the salt balance and all this nervous energy etc so it is called shravana vratam you see our swami ji asked some of us to do that for a long time then he said relax because we mood shravana vratam taniki believe it or not i really really understood the taste of bindi or ladies finger as they call it in india very very biased so okra okay so it's biased against males by the way you see <laughs> and uh, okra okra we all had the masala ki salam put the real taste of okra we have never dreamt when you eat a vegetable without a salt once in a month you will appreciate a real taste pleasure is that na otherwise all you need a tablet a mulunga de thana the reason why we have food stuff is to enjoy the varieties of taste in it na when you have food without salt that day as a vrata that's my motivation to please bhagavan that's a religious motivation it actually exposes me to the real taste of okra the real taste of uh, the various other vegetables etc because salt it disguises that state and start dominating that taste there i like it you see and so they designed it that way some people do kritika nakshatra vratam somavara vratam idella or weekly cycle depending on who is your favorite deity skip a meal or just replace a meal etc and uh, that is the beauty of the system which uh, we brought in you see and uh, one worrying phenomena i see which i don't know you are all helpless also is the children watching youtube while they are being fed it's almost uh, ubiquitous not only in america all over the world we are we are escaping five six tantrums but we are creating an impression of get distracted be stimulated crave and edho uh, panaba in my reacts you see because both are busy and the mother is busy i don't know it's a problem i am not trying to take sides here but please understand that it's a problem for the child now just how we are very carefully choosing what the child ingests na we we also need to understand some basic psychology of now we are telling the child while you eat get distracted at least during eating which is a fundamental need for us as a body other at least you can focus in heat if possible the worst distraction we ever had in our earlier there is this out outbound ingestion <laughs> see so the mother used to take the child out and say see kaka you have this ball of rice for kaka and this ball of rice for sparrow this ball of rice for chanda mama the mari that was the only distraction they ever attempted but now what happens is too much of the child not even focusing on what he is eating it's not enjoying what it is eating it is constantly distracted even while eating and uh, imagine what are we setting up the child for you see physically the child is fit inga problem because it needs that stimulation all the time and it needs to see that running images all the time and uh, we used to eat with a story where we have only one stimulation the benign stimulation of our body is always through the ears you see because the ears makes you imagine which means you are not stimulated outwards the stimulation or the trigger is within you and but when you have a multimedia stuff out there where something is running there is music it's multiple stimulation triggered at the same time and a child is growing up with that as its baseline what will happen to get it may get a plus and all that no doubt it is going to listen to music while studying because it needs that stimulation of just a science book is not enough for the child now it needs a multiple sensory stimulation now you see and now uh, multitasking has become a part of life but research has again and again proven multitasking is going to wreck us you see it is not something which is uh, which is not possible first of all and it it is something which is not going to really uh, take us in the path of happiness or attention etc yes the child may get a plus everywhere so life is not just grades grades are important no doubt but then there is life beyond grades na there has to be happiness there has to be a sense of aesthetic there has to be a sense of uh, attention there has to be a sense of focus purpose 
all that is contra to the stimulation which we get from all over the place even when we drive now you have a neon stimulation there is a movie now in roads which is advertising you know tires uh, accident don't worry i am here to help you call jack or something like that when you look at it obviously you have to call jack you see and you are distracted dhamal uh, see i told you you will call me uh, self fulfilling props so now that's why believe it or not uh, many times when uh, i remember seeing some very rural families where when a child comes and says enna pa pandrathu ponam summa karumba adu evlo periya activity theri no people cannot sit idle people want a cure for boredom and uh, the whole problem is nothing can cure boredom until you face it distractions and uh, you know stimulation cannot fuel boredom cannot cannot uh, solve boredom it means each time i get a stimulus law of diminishing returns i would want more 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 and when the child becomes uh, young and uh, all these hormones are kicking in there now adu romba danger a poi isti because that stimulation is not enough so more tom and jerry water la poradu po adunala it is better of course you can't escape a, a world of manipulation and uh, distraction contain we can contain and the reason why we used physiology to explain that is for you parents to understand it first please do a little research when when we bring a life to this world we are responsible isn't it not only for its physical uh, maintenance or physical growth but also for its complete life skills including a capacity to relish small things capacity to be grateful capacity to focus capacity to be attentive all that is our responsibility till we have some control over them right at the point of time we should know now what it is we can't say the lanak burila doesn't matter struggle man. what is there experiment i guess and uh, our swami ji has told this to parents uh, there was a very nasty incident which happened in tamil nadu i can't even tell that here and this was putting lot of our uh, young girls to great danger in uh, tamil nadu if you, because of social platforms and this you know or or mariana or flashy stuff where they get in and they get caught and they are helpless lach swami ji became very concerned then he called one of our uh, sisters in uh, satsang to call all the parents to tell them that be aware of what is happening be aware of what is happening inside your child's uh, brain be aware of what is happening in the heart of the child and uh, you, our job is not just abri uh, kudade but how do i give the right you know uh, ambience for the child it may be inconvenient right now but it will be very grateful once it grows up i have heard from our own children that i am not mature enough to make a decision but my parents are saying you decide you decide what do i do under the kuzhande you see but you can't tell the mother and father for whatever reason maybe prestige issue or whatever but at times we have to help them in decision making which means at times you have to exert authority and now the whole idea of uh, you know don't you know mistake me i saw a very funny video a five year old child tommy we are going to the supermarket is it okay and this five year old child says mm mm-hmm. and i may have to put the seat belt for you when you sit in the car is it okay five year old what are you doing to this child they need some authority until they have some maturity to think for themselves you don't have to take their permission you know and i find it very funny coming from india maybe it makes absolute sense for you being here but then i was surprised i'm just mentioning it as a surprising thing there is uh, i am not trying to tell you what to do what not to do obviously but i was surprised you see when there has to be authority there has to be authority when there has to be a watchful eye there has to be a watchful eye not to bridle their freedom but to ensure that unbridled freedom does not get them into trouble and then we should not come back crying the child needs that authority i have heard it from our children at times they confide na they say i'm very happy to do because my mother and father put that conditions there i'm happy they put the condition otherwise i wouldn't do it it's it was eye opening to me you see 
and uh, uh, we can't expect tremendous maturity from our children until they are mature na so we as parents i guess need to understand these things what creates habits and not to make it a moral issue you see morality won't work we have to understand the science behind morality or the spiritual science behind morality so that we help the child or help ourselves child na all of us only help ourselves to lead a better life of not mediocrity of being driven by habits craving or second hand life abillama we can enhance our life i'm not even talking about realization yanam bhakti illa apra i'm not even talking about yana bhakti vairagi or human life alaga to lead a life which is fulfilling where i have control about what i do i understand what is happening within me i understand what is happening around me i'm aware of what is happening in the society we are living here we can't shut ourselves out from the society some basic awareness doesn't mean news binging okay some basic awareness of what is happening in high school what is happening in middle school what is happening in elementary school because unless you have that understanding how can we ever be a responsible parent or caregiver isn't it? so that is the reason why we thought understand these also even if we don't understand it fully we have a, some understanding that there is a chemical which makes us crave so what is this craving na hari is some you know chemical in my head doing it na do i want to be uh, a slave of an eight carbon molecule <laughs> and uh, how can i manage na there is science behind it and that's what we try to cover in the last week huh? how we actually understand how habits kicking how do i use the same cue same reward and try to change the behavior how do you piggy back another behavior with the current behavior use the same binging as a reward and find ways and means not to binge again by putting boundaries take help of people and uh, you know uh, that will help you not to be devoid of you know of course we need stimulation uh, of course we need a little high in our life all that that's all fine uh, but uh, use that with moderation by interspreading things which needed to be done or uh, things which are so called healthy uh, healthy habits and you can use this little uh, rarity of you know uh, treating yourself with uh, uh, a chocolate or treating yourself with a youtube video once you finish that and you will find both to be enjoyable you have the motivation to complete that which we need and we also have a real reward not a notion of a reward where we actually enjoy the five minutes close finish keep going if you if we think that we are not strong enough to stop somewhere get help now there are people around us saying that you know i'm going to do this after 10 minutes to do something make sure that i don't see it after 10 minutes it's a self imposed control over binging you can work that out you see that is the beauty of uh, understanding how these things work habits how dopamine works dopamine gives the craving to us and in a romba achariya i'll tell you this much i am taking too much of your time and as i said this is not a typical satsang it is just a chat so it's not even a formal lecture and i may drop in here and there i may remember something and tell you i may pause to think what do you say next i don't know i got it something like that okay so here two things i thought i want to tell you is i have been telling that in our bhagavatam sessions how it beautifully relates to this bhagavad gita i am going to cover that on saturdays but i don't know which year we are going to cover this but in bhagavad gita bhagavan says i have told you this before i am dharma virodha dharma avirodha kamam which means that desire that motivation which is required for us humans to make sure that our basic necessities are all fulfilled like healthy body thirst is fulfilled hunger is fulfilled and then we have our lineage which is not broken and the vishayathukella irukra kaamama i am says bhagavan huh? and then he says kama yesha krodha yesha rajo guna samudbhava he says that kama if it is dharma avirodham has nothing to do with me you see it has become a you become a slave to a habit then you have to be responsible for i am not responsible i have given you a system you manage it when i read about dopamine and the researches they did with dopamine 
uh, you know, uh, physiologically, Bhagavan is talking about that because if there is no dopamine system in our head, it's called limbic system or whatever, if the dopamine is not in our head, that molecule which you saw, believe it or not, we won't even feel the motivation to eat because hunger, no, uh, there is a hunger, na? that hunger uh, need is actually moving us into action of searching for food only through this dopamine. Dharma, avirodha, kamamna, to take care of our hunger, take care of our thirst, some basic needs. And that Bhagavan has put in us in the head. And they found out if the rats huh, don't have the dopamine, if they cut off the dopamine supply to the rat, the rat does not even want to run around to eat for food or to uh, go around search for water to drink. It will just keep staying there. Or it has no motivation to even sustain its vegetative life. You see? Apo, Bhagavan has created a system. And I'm really, really, because of my bias, no doubt, I can't imagine such a perfect system as a result of an accident, even if you give me 20 million years. How is it possible? You see? And each time I see all these signs, maybe it's my bias, I'm even more wondering what a perfect system, what an intricate system, what a wonderful complex system of checks and balances Bhagavan has created as this body. And then I remembered Yogi Ram Surat Kumar saying that why are you looking for miracles outside? Your body itself is a miracle, your life is a miracle, the entire universe is a miracle. Nah? It's miraculous. It's miraculous. So Bhagavan uses karma in two contexts. One is that motivation, that desire to live, you see, which means I have to eat in time, I have to drink in time, I have to breathe properly, all that stuff. Eating and drinking specifically, that is done by this chemical in your head. And Bhagavan says, I have, when I say I am a Nartha, it is his job. So his, his design and the designer are not seen separate in Sanatana Dharma. So all our beautiful design is there. And then he says, if you allow this system to take you for a ride by all this craving, etc., uh, you are not helpless, first of all, because there are way out of all this. Which means I need to understand how it works. I need to understand my own life. You don't need an external moral for me to run my life once you understand science. I clearly understand. I binge. But I'm not getting that pleasure. Yet I have the craving. It's a paradox. It's not a paradox. It's dopamine talking to you. You see? Try to detox ourselves from that. And there are methods for it. You see, you can search it in the net, you'll get it. And just wetting your appetite for this. And Bhagavan separated these two. That which is an essential need and the motivation to meet your essential needs is also done by this chemical, which is a process here. And that which completely wrecks our life, it makes us physically, you know, blurry-eyed and, you know, sleep-deprived. Uh, especially I've seen some of uh, uh, my own uh, friends, if you can use that term, uh, caught in this gaming thing, especially the social game. Social gaming, you, know, you have all your friends and they have to play together, which means you have to come together, you have to play, they do it all through the night, their health is spoiled, all that stuff. And then I ask them, the joy is in being with friends. <laughs> But when you do it through this gaming, beyond a point, it actually becomes a stress. It actually becomes a source of ill health. Actually, it doesn't give that pleasure, which it is promising, but craving is there. If you just observe that, the mischief is out in the open, that I am not getting the joy as much as I expected, but my expectation is sustained. There is a mischief. Na? That is a mischief, or that is the misuse of this chemical which we got. And once I understand it, I don't need morals to run my life if I understand this properly and if I'm intelligent. Morals are there only as a support to reiterate my own experience of what is happening within me, what is happening around me. If I'm conscious of that, I am moral by design. I don't need somebody to enforce it on me if I'm conscious. And thankfully, we are in the cusp of all these discoveries where if you understand this itself, you'll understand what am I doing with my life, you see. And that is the reason why we thought just to sort of stimulate your appetite. There are some 
wonderful stuff in the net also which talked about the simple process of something in your head is secreted uh, and that creates all see the lot of varaga siddha says there are four uh, mangoes in four corners uh, of your head uh, it is secreting that uh, chemical and that's why our shiva peruman has uh, chandra in the head ad amrita dharavar da there is something which is crescent in our brain which actually gives us some amrita dhara in physiologically also you can take it yogically you will see it as a vision physiologically obviously the body has to be in line with all your uh, spiritual growth also until we leave this body you see and so uh, your yogi's body will be very different you see from a normal person's body in fact i have seen some videos of a yogi from india who came to us in the early 70s he had tremendous control over his heart beat he asked a person what number any number between 0 to 72 and they say 36 five minutes la he is saying i am going to go into meditation you will have 36 beats per minute and wrong and correct the 36 beats and he says i can change the temperature between my lie, right hand uh, index finger and left hand index finger will have a temperature difference of 5 degrees now 5 degrees temperature difference are the control they have so they they that which is so called automatic that which is so called you know just happens without any of our uh, additions etc yogis are able to control everything how now purely by controlling the mind controlling the breath so ananda they have it in a very different language it's all there all this limbic system all yogic literature la irukke but they have their own language they have their own code word because it's an experiential thing na so only a yogi will understand another yogi's code word you see it's called parlance paribhasha mm-hmm. like that everybody has their own paribhasha and so that is the beauty of now the paribhasha or the parlance or the language which mostly the next generation will understand better apart from the satsang children or truly satsang children is the language of physiology and the beauty with our way of life our practices yes it seems each paper i read seems to only strengthen the conviction in the wonderful way of life which we have designed with we didn't do it uh, with all the research we must have done it intuitively we must have done it by trial and error i don't know but because we are one of the most ancient civilization and thankfully to this day we have some uh, fragments or some segments at least some uh, shadow <laughs> of that thinking in us even though we are miles and miles apart from the mainland each of this physiological research psychological research seems to only strengthen the grandness and the greatness and the almost the near perfection i say near perfection because i think it's perfect but just to give a little uh, you know margin for a little disagreement i'm saying it is near perfect and so if we can adapt uh, that which you have invited from our religion understand its principle as much possible and then apply i think we have an edge over any other uh, group of people when i say edge not competitive i'm saying we have this inbuilt edge for us to lead a more balanced happy fulfilling meaningful life and for those who decide to take a spiritual plunge it is easier whenever you want to take it maybe 60 years 70 years now suddenly it's not possible remember the craving if away when i am very strong etc i am not able to control it what will happen to me when i am 70 you see and that is the reason why uh, such practices where have a zero stimulation hour have a zero stimulation day have a zero stimulation either physical or mental or all these things huh? we can do all that and then see how much we are craving and then we are understanding what am i doing with myself i need to make a change i can't let my life to be kicked around by a manipulative distractive world outside then i take control of my life then i have a good in the for today sarvatra govinda naam sankirtanam tomorrow in our inter- intelligent living series we are going to cover a little different stuff we are going to talk about the various ancient doctrines and systems in hinduism we have been always talking only bhagavatam we have been talking mainly only uh, vedantam from bhagavatam bhagavad gita etc but there were many other schools in hinduism 
and jeevodi wants sanatana dharma to be well understood even though we propagate bhagavata dharma without sanatana dharma where is bhagavata dharma so sanatana dharma's exposition just to know how much advanced it was in thinking and openness and uh, you know there were disparity of views and people respected that and quoted that saying that these maharishis told like this i beg to differ you see the attack was only on ideas never on people that was the culture of india in fact they encouraged atheists to have their own philosophy strengthened because they understand unless i am aware enough or strong enough to to withstand the attacks from an opponent i become weak over million you understand what i'm saying adu alagana or nyayam i will tell that tomorrow it's called stuna kanana nyayam nu peru stuna kanana nyayam what it really means it uh, i saw it in uh, singapore huh? they actually brought a palm tree <laughs> okay and suddenly in a park there was a line of palm trees in two days and they just brought it they dug a hole it's like a v shaped hole they put a palm tree they close it palm tree starts growing there and when they actually put a palm tree in that hole you know what they do after they put the hole before they finally sort of or art art what so that the roots etc settle inside the sand and then they seal the sand it becomes a very healthy tree so to shake a pole or shake a tree before you seal the planting of the tree helps the tree to grow better when you actually plant a pole or art art it then we close it so our mahatma start i need opponents to be strong so that whenever required they can shake the tree which may be uncomfortable during that moment but if i can withstand that shaking it is going to stay for million years to come adinal they say if you are a buddhist na they are very happy they say yeah you please go ahead we want you to be there as an opponent so that we strengthen our own philosophy we say we you know trying to opposing your ideas and if i stifle your voice i become weak another issue i i got an equivalent uh, american story for it. it seems a guy had a corn field and he was always having the best corn field of the year award huh and uh, the neighboring uh, people would come and say tell me what is your secret he'll openly say this is what is my secret go do it next year again he got it again he got it then he said are yaar then a consultant came you are not supposed to tell these secrets and all that stuff and that person said is that so he said yes okay so my fees na i don't want your consult bro he left then next year he won then his neighbor said are yaar you are such a noble person you are allowing all your secrets improvements to be shared with all of us he said look here if my crops has to be healthy all the crops around me also have to be healthy because finally pollination inge and varudha ange and varudhi if you are weak and i am healthy na naalike i am not going to get the best crop out here and for me to always maintain my quality my neighbor's quality of the fields is also very important for me so i am actually doing it out of my self interest only why didn't you tell the consultant not on punch like consultant told na not to tell the secret eh? <laughs> so i didn't tell him <laughs> so here that's the principle of hinduism where they want all regions to flourish in their region in their limits so that i can strengthen my religion and i know how to defend my religion idea attack that i don't mean political attack social attack adalna it's not even it's not even right so that's not what i'm talking about the idea is uh, we don't want to stifle so people who are completely atheists also are respected and they started as a starting argument to refute it so for that they need them to think hard <laughs> because that is the confidence they had in truth because they saw the truth na it's not belief na when you believe you are very threatened when you realize you are not threatened in fact you feel very happy when you get an opposing view so that you in your experience can come out and say this is how i am going to refute your view since sanatana dharma was based on experience they encouraged uh, diversity of voices diversity of doctrines so that they can establish their vedic doctrine with even more gusto and even more uh, strength like that you know shaking the pole before you was a you know, so sanatana dharma includes a lot of doctrines and uh, 
we will see this very wide spectrum of all that to understand the breadth i won't go deep into it to understand the breadth of sanatana dharma uh, and some basic precepts in it just to get an idea what that hindu is otherwise our children will come back tell only two things n n there is a social system in sanatana dharma which is a problem there are 33 million deities so idhe thana pesi irukirathu why we can teach them there are sanatana dharma is a big ocean or chippi eduthuta pesi irukke you take a shell and talk about the quality of ocean there are gems there manikam there and all that once you understand all that you will understand even the chippi properly you see that is the reason why we will expose ourselves just to enjoy to be grateful to our rishis how do we show our gratitude to the rishis na spend one hour listen to it and feel the greatness feel grateful that's all there it is the rishi rinam you see and the rinam means uh, indebtedness how do you uh, uh, how do you take care of the indebtedness of those rishis na by gratitude remembering them hmm? that's what we are planning to do uh, frankly this is my strategy i first announce something and then it kicks in a little bit of uh, adrenaline inside are you solid and so let me prepare Uh, that is how i work so i have, that's why i told you today and we will again meet sarvatra govinda naam sankirtanam hare ram hare ram 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 hare 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 krishna hare krishna 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 hare hare 